Okay, let's get back to where we were. So, we had talked earlier about coal bonds, and we said that coal bonds gave the borrower the right but not the obligation to force the lender to sell back their bonds at a premium. A put bond is just the opposite thing. It allows the uh, borrower to force, or it allows the lender to force the borrower to buy back the bond at a discount. For shame, you are late, both of you. At least she's here this time. Okay, so this is the opposite. Why would this be a good, by the way, call bonds, we said, are riskier for bondholders. Put bonds are safer, and here's why. If I can sell that bond at any time I want back to the borrower for $900, that means the most my capital losses on that bond will ever be are $100. Is it falls from 1000 down to 900 And so what would happen that would make that valuable? Interest rates go up. Something happens that makes the company riskier. In either one of those cases, in theory, uh, if the bond value goes below $900, all I have to do is force them to buy the bond back. But there is a caveat, and here it is. If the company is in bad shape, and that's what's made their cost of borrowing go up, and that's what's made the bond price go down, it's possible that they won't have the money to buy back your bond. So are put bonds safer than bonds without the put option? Yes. Are they risk-free? Absolutely not. Question. We call this putting a floor to your losses. Now let's talk about bond markets. Bond markets are over the counter. And here, oh, for shame, she's late. So here's what we mean by over the counter. You're buying from dealers. And the dealer maintains an inventory. And they stand ready to buy or sell. Back in the old days, bonds were actually paper. And they were actually sitting behind the counter. And so that's why it's called the over the counter market. But these days, it's electronic. The bonds are electronic, the dealers are electronic, and the really cool thing about that is now, not only do you have access to your local bond dealer, you have access to every other bond dealer through this computerized network. And so you get a better deal because undoubtedly uh, the price of your dealer here locally might be higher than some other dealer, so you can get it wherever has the best price. Now. What do dealers do? They stand ready to buy at the bid price and sell at the ask price. Dealers make their money by the difference between the ask price and the bid price. So if they're buying at the bid price, you know the ask price has to be higher or they wouldn't be able to make money. Now, dealers buy at the bid. What does that mean for you as an investor? That means that you are, uh, you are buying at the ask, right? You are buying at the ask and you are selling at the bid. It's just opposite between bond dealers and bond buyers or investors. Why do I make this point really, really clear? Because it will show up on the exam in one question. Do you like me to say it one more time? Okay, so dealers buy at the bid price, but if you, the investor, buy, you buy at the ask. And dealers sell at the ask, but if you go to sell a bond to them, they, you only get the bid. And so selling and buying have to be just the opposite between dealers and investors. We say that anybody who is holding an inventory and stands ready to buy or sell is said to be making a market. And so you could say that your local used car or your local car dealer is making a market in cars. Do they hold an inventory? Yes. Do they stand ready to sell? All day. Do they stand ready to buy? Yeah, absolutely. I have sold a car to a dealership before without buying another one of their crummy cars. And so it's you could totally think of them as being this definition of making a market. Now what does that mean? It means that any time you want, you can buy or sell a bond if someone's making a market in it. You don't have to go out and find another buyer or another seller to, to match up. Questions? 
Okay. So, bond quotes. Here's something you need to write down. Bonds are quoted as a percentage of face value. Bonds are quoted as a percentage of face value. And so when we see the bid and the ask up here, there are numbers like 99.9375. That is 99.9375% of face value. If the face value of the bond is 1,000, all we have to do is multiply that bid number by 10 because it's 1,000 divided by 100% gives us that 10 multiplier, just like with the coupons. And so you can see that it would cost you $999.38, uh, or you would receive $998.38 if you sold one of those bonds, but if you went out to buy one, you would have to pay $999.77. So you are paying a percentage of the face value. That's how these things are quoted. Notice the coupons are quoted in the same way, as a percentage of face value, right? It's a percentage of face value. And so if you go back to our old friend current yield, remember that current yield was equal to annual coupon divided by price, right? And what we've got here is that that's actually the coupon rate times the face value. And down here, we'll have the quote times the face value. What happens to face value? It just cancels out, right? And so you can also, if you were given quotes like this, you can figure out the current yield on a bond simply by taking the coupon rate and divide it by the quoted price. Now, which price do you use, bid or ask? You use the one you're going to be paying. Mm -hmm. Which would be which one? Ask. Yeah, the ask. If, if you look at something and you see a low price and a high price and you say, ooh, I wonder which I'll pay. It's always the high price, right? Unless you're a dealer, they're always gonna make you pay the higher price and give you the lower price if you sell. That's just how they make their living. Okay, now let's talk about change. The change is the change in the price since the close of market from yesterday. In this case, all of the bonds, by the way, in the United States, red means down, right? So the price of all of these bonds are down from yesterday. What does that mean must have happened to interest rates since yesterday? Yeah, they went up. Does that make sense? Okay, and then there's one more thing over here, that's the ask yield. That is the yield to maturity based on the asked price, because after all, the asked price is what you're going to pay. We could actually calculate that if we had one more piece of information. If we knew the date of these quotes, we could actually calculate that ask yield for ourselves. Fortunately, though, it is included in the quote. So, what do you need to get out of this? Number one, bonds are quoted as a percentage of face value. You can multiply by face value, uh, actually you just multiply by 10 if the face value is 1,000, right? That's gonna give you the price of what you would have to pay. Do you have to pay the ask or the bid? The ask. And whenever you're doing calculations like current yield, you should use the quoted ask price because that's what you're going to have to pay. Questions? Would it be handy to have this formula on your note sheet? I would think so. Okay, now let's talk about inflation and interest rates. If you go out and loan money to someone at 10%, and then the inflation rate is 15%, the money that you get back is going to be worth less than the money you loaned out. And so we're going to introduce this idea of the real interest rate, and then we'll talk about nominal rates. By the way, the rates you see every day in the real world are nominal rates. Write that down. The rates you see every day in the real world are nominal rates. 
What are nominal rates? Nominal rates speak to the number of units of currency you're going to receive back for your initial investment. It doesn't say anything about the purchasing power of those units of currency. What about real rates? Real rates talk about the increase in your ability to consume as a result of having made an investment. December 31st, I have money enough to buy 10 pizzas for a New Year's party. But instead of throwing the New Year's party, I cancel it and I take my 10 pizzas worth of money and I put it in the bank. And then next year, December 31st, I have enough money now in my account for 11 pizzas. What was my real rate of return? 11 minus 10 divided by 10 tells me my real rate of return was 10%. I was able to increase my consumption by 10%. Now notice, did I mention a number of dollars? No. Did I even mention currency at all? No, not at all. Uh, some of you are from countries where you have huge amounts of inflation. Uh, you would be more interested in this real return than the nominal return because you could be getting a thousand percent on your investment and still be falling behind if inflation was greater than one thousand percent. Okay, how do we relate these two things? Well, first of all, let's uh, define these different rates as far as the, the variables go. Big R is the nominal rate. Big R is the nominal rate. Now, the nominal rate includes both, it accounts for the real return that's required and inflation. It's going to be higher. It's going to be higher, assuming that uh, real rates of return are, well, I should say, <laughs> assuming positive real rates of return and positive inflation, uh, big R, nominal rate, is going to be larger than um, the required, sorry, the real return. Okay, how are they related? By this equation, one plus big R is equal to one plus little r, which is your real rate of return, multiplied by one plus H. Now, here we are using H for inflation. Why do you think we don't use I? That's interest. Yeah, people get confused and think it's interest. Uh, some professors, including Doug Witte, use pi. Why is that a bad idea? Because it's mathematical constant. Yeah, do you know how many people I've seen write 1 plus 3.14, right? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, it's so sad. So that's why we use H. So H is inflation here. Now, I'm going to tell you an approximation here. But I'm also going to tell you to never use the approximation in my class. Never use the approximation in my class Never use the approximation where real money is involved. When is it acceptable to use the approximation? You and your friends are hanging out in the bar after work and you are doing some quick and dirty calculations on the cocktail napkins as MBAs will do, right? That's the only time. That is the only time because it is not correct. It's this R plus H that leaves off one more factor, which is, at the end, if we look at the real one, it's plus R sub H, if I go ahead and solve for all that. And so the bigger your required return, or your real return is, and the bigger inflation is, the worse the error will be in using the approximation. The worse the error will be in the, using the approximation. For my exams, what should you use? Yeah, the, the full one, right? Not the approximation. Use the Fisher effect. Okay, now, you can solve this thing for any one of those three variables. I'm really good at algebra, so I would just have one of these formulas on my sheet. You guys are probably not as good at algebra, so what should you do? Solve them for each of these variables ahead of time. So, for instance, if I were going to solve for, one, uh, for a little r, the first thing I would do is divide both sides by 1 plus h. And then I would just subtract 1, right? And so you can solve for any of those three. I would have all those on my uh, note sheet. Would I have the approximation on my note sheet? No. 
Now let's talk about the term structure of interest rates. It turns out that interest rates in the short term are usually lower than interest rates in the long term. And we're going to talk about why that is. But we have this thing called the term structure of interest rates, and it's typically, 95% of the time, it's upward sloping. Upward sloping means that the short term rates are lower than the long term rates. In fact, banks depend on an upward sloping term structure in order to make any money. And here's how that works. They're going to take deposits from you either in savings accounts or checking accounts that are very short term deposits and therefore they pay low interest rates and then they're going to lo loan them out for longer terms. Longer terms have higher interest rates. And so while they may be collecting 7% off a mortgage, they're only paying you 3% for your savings. That difference is how they make their money. Now I say this is how things look during normal times. Uh, sometimes things happen and we end up with a downward sloping term structure, which is what the bottom is. And that is where the short term interest rates are higher than the long term interest rates. What do you think that does to banks? Every time we see a downward sloping term structure that has any legs to it at all, we see bank failures every time, every time. And so this is a problem for banks if it looks like the bottom. Now let's talk about the layers. This is like a layer cake. And the bottom layer of both of these is the real rate. That is your increase in your ability to consume as a result of making the investment. And we have no reason to assume, no theoretical reason to assume that the re required real rate changes with the time to maturity. The next piece is the inflation premium. Because remember, this is a nominal interest rate we're talking about here. It's got that inflation premium in it. And if inflation is considered to be uh, steady, if our expectation of, it, of inflation is steady, then we are going to have an upward sloping term structure because the very top there is the interest rate risk premium. We talked earlier about interest rate risk. We said it was greater for bonds with longer times to maturity. And so it makes perfect sense that that interest rate risk is going to do like this. It continues to increase, but at a decreasing rate, the longer out in time that you get. Okay, what happens though is that sometimes we let inflation get out of control, like we did here fairly recently. And what did the Federal Reserve do in order to try to bring inflation under control? Yeah, they raised interest rates, so specifically short-term interest rates. And so when they raise short-term interest rates, it's going to do two things. Number one, it's going to increase, uh, you, you're going to have higher interest rates in the short term. But the other thing is it's going to reduce people's inflation expectations. They're like, oh yeah, the Federal Reserve's on the job. We don't need to price in this extraordinary inflation for the rest of our lives. That's going to go away. And so as a result, you might see the inflation premium now downward sloping. And at some point, if that inflation premium is declining fast enough, that increase in the interest rate risk premium isn't enough to keep this thing upward sloping. And now it becomes downward sloping. And so what we're seeing going on here is uh, both inflation is a result of central bank activities along with government free wheel spending. And then the, uh, the second part is definitely a result of central bank action because they're basically trying to pull money in off the streets by having higher short term interest rates. Which one of these would you rather have if you were a banker? Yeah, the top one. Which one leads to potential bank failures? The bottom one. Uh, right now, what do you think we have? Yeah, we've got the top one. Uh, there were a couple of times here within the last couple of years where it kind of looked, yeah, a little dangerous. And by the way, did we have bank failures? Yeah, Silicon Valley Bank? 
Oh, you got to keep up with your Wall Street Journal ratings. Yeah. Uh, we've had we've had bank failures, and we have another one that's kind of totter, teetering on the edge right now. So let's talk about what goes into bond yields. We've talked about that term structure stuff. By the way, that uh, term structure is for zero, uh, it's just like for zero coupon United States Treasury bonds of those different maturities. It contains those three layers that we've already talked about. But if you go out and you find a bond elsewhere, like for a corporation, we're going to have to add in a default risk premium. Because we said the United States government is default risk-free, is United Airlines. No, airlines go bankrupt all the time. Then we have the taxability premium. Remember we said that municipal bonds uh, return less than um, regular bonds on a pre-tax basis, but on an after-tax basis, uh, we see that they might return more depending on your marginal tax rate. Now, what does that mean? If the uh, returns of your bond are taxable, you're going to have to pay a higher rate because people are only concerned in their after-tax returns, right? That's the reason municipal bonds exist. And so we call that the taxability premium. And then finally, I think the book refers to this, to this as the liquidity premium, but it should actually be the illiquidity premium. And here's what we're talking about. Being liquid is the ability to sell something for at or near its full market value in a short amount of time. If the bond is out there being publicly traded, it's really easy, right? It's really easy. You just go out there and sell your bond and you're out of it. So you could buy a 30-year bond. You don't have to hold it for 30 years. You could sell it whenever you want as long as someone is making a market. But there are plenty of bonds out there for which nobody is making a market. A lot of the municipal bonds are this way. And so that means basically when you buy those bonds, you either have to find someone on your own who wants to buy those bonds, or you have to hold on to them until they mature. Let's talk about why that might be a risk. There's a young man. He has $25,000 and he thinks he won't need it for the next five years. So he decides to buy a note. He decides to buy a note and he goes down and they have two notes available. One is one that's traded on the open market that he'll be able to sell it at any time he wants. And the yield to maturity on it is around 6%. And then there is one for the Springfield School District that is not being publicly traded and he'll basically have to hold on to it for the whole five years. But it's paying a half percent extra in yield to maturity. Now, little does this guy realize that that is the liquidity premium. But he says, wait a minute, I don't need the money for another five years. Why not? So he goes for it and he buys the Springfield School District bond. That night, he goes out for dinner with his girlfriend. And she says, I've been thinking we should get married. And he says, I've been thinking that too. And she says, I've been thinking I need an engagement ring. By the way, gentlemen, it's always dangerous when a woman says, I've been thinking, right? You're going to have to do some work or spend some money or both, right? Okay, so, and, and he says, yeah, I've been thinking the same thing. And then he says, wait a minute, where are you talking about getting this ring? And she says, Cartier and all the color leaves his face. And he says, how much is this going to cost me? And she says, about $25,000. He says, I have good news. I have $25,000. You just have to wait five years. How do you think the story ends? Yeah, I try to put it in optimistic terms and say the young man gets a new girlfriend, right? Because we know what's going to happen. Okay, so that's the danger. That's the danger of having these illiquid investments. You may need the money, but you can't get to it because these things are not being traded. So, of course, you're going to demand a higher yield to maturity to compensate you for that risk. Any questions? Okay. By the way, should you buy a diamond ring at Cartier? No. 
Um, when you, you can't tell by looking at them, right? Every time I see a woman get engaged with a ring from Tiffany, the only reason you can tell that the ring came from Tiffany is because in the picture on Instagram, she's holding the box, right? I'm like, buy her the ring somewhere else and just find the box. Okay. So now we're going to talk about stock. So first we're going to talk about valuing stock. And we remember that the price or value of anything is the present value of the expected future cash flows discounted at a rate appropriate to the risk. Well, what are the expected future cash flows of stocks? Well, if the stock pays dividend, and by the way, they don't have to, but if they pay dividends, that's going to be one of the sets of cash flows that you get. And the other way stocks produce cash is when you sell them at the end. And so if we just take the present value of the dividends we're going to receive and the present add the present value of the amount we sell the stock for, then that's going to give us the present value or price of the stock. That's all we have to do. It's really, really easy to value stock. So let's talk about this model. We're going to make the assumption that the stock only pays one dividend per year. By the way, D1, cash flows in finance happen at the end of the period, unless you're told otherwise. D1 happens at the end of year one. Uh, P1 is the price for which I could sell these shares at the end of year one. And so all I have to do is take the dividend uh, to be paid at time one and divide by one plus the required return. By the way, that's the present value formula, right? Future value divided by one plus R to the T. T in this case is only one. And then we have the same, we do the same thing with the price of the stock that we're going to get at the end of the year. So it's really, really easy. But my question to you is this. Can you know for sure what the price of the stock is going to be in one year? No, if you can, come to my office. We will get rich together. But I have, I have, no one's ever taken me up on that offer in 20 years of teaching. Okay, now you say, wait a minute, then this formula is totally worthless. No, don't worry, it's really not worthless because what we know is that the price at time one is the present value of the second dividend and then you add the second uh, price. So problem solved, except for one thing. Which do you think is harder to predict, P1 or P2? P2. Now, here's the trick though. We can continue to play this game on and on and on until we push out that last term. And it looks like this, plus P, you guys know what that is? Infinity. Infinity. Divide by one plus R to the infinity. As long as R is positive, this is 1.0 whatever to the infinite power. Is that a big number or small number? It's a flipping huge number, right? And when I divide anything by a flipping huge number, what do I get? Zero. You get something very, 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 very tiny. And so what we're saying here is what we, uh, what we do instead of worried about the price, we just say, hey, we're just going to take the present value of all the expected dividends. It solves the problem quite nicely. Now, write that down. The stock price is the present value of all the expected dividends. By the way, I have to say expected. Do we know the dividends with certainty? No. You said the stock price is this present? The present value of all the expected future dividends. By the way, you don't get D0. You don't get D0. Unless I tell you otherwise, you don't get D0. Okay, so we're going to value stock in three different ways. The first one is called zero dividend growth. If a dividend grows at zero, that means it stays the same. You may also hear this called constant dividends. Constant dividends. So next to zero growth, write constant dividends. Next to zero growth, write constant dividends. 
Not to be confused with the next one, which is constant dividend growth, which is where the dividend grows at the same rate until the end of time. That's constant dividend growth. And then we've got the one that students hate the most, differential dividend growth or supernormal growth. Okay, now I just got you telling you that stock price is the present value of all the future dividends. And you say, oh, wait a minute, there are stocks out there that don't pay any dividends at all, and yet they have a positive stock price. How can that be? What do we expect those firms to start doing at some point? They're going to eventually, they're going to start paying dividends. So let's think about this from a perspective of the company's growth opportunities and investments. When the company has a lot of growth opportunities, they are going to take all that net income and reinvest it into the company. So the dividends will be zero. And all that money will go into addition to retained earnings, right? Now, down the road, at some point, the growth opportunities, or so the size of the company versus the growth opportunities, is going to make it to where they don't need all of their net income to be new internal equity. So then they can start paying dividends. And so companies have this life cycle, just like humans do, right? Companies grow fast in the beginning. Humans grow fast in the beginning. But aren't you glad that we don't keep growing at the same rate? Right? Otherwise, one person would fill this entire room at age 17. And so you end up with companies doing the same thing. They can't grow at these breakneck uh, speeds forever. And it just always cracks me up to hear people say, oh yeah, they're going to grow 20% for 20 a year forever. Wrong. At some point, every man, woman, and child on the planet will have an iPhone. Right? Where's the, where's the growth going to come from? It's not. It's just not going to happen. So these companies go through these growth phases to where eventually they're not growing as fast as the uh, equity that they're developing, so they start to pay dividends. And so just because a company is not paying dividends today doesn't mean that we don't expect it to pay in the future. In fact, if we never expected it to pay dividends at all, it would have a stock price of zero, right? Because you're looking at the present value of those cash flows that are coming to you as a shareholders, shareholder. By the way, earnings per share. Sometimes the, uh, the multiple choice question will say, uh, instead of saying dividends, it'll say earnings per share. Why might that not be correct? In fact, there's only one case in which it would be correct. If the firm paid out all of their net income as dividends, then it is the present value of all the earnings per share going forward. But if they're retaining any of that money whatsoever, that is not correct. I feel something strange going off my nose here. Okay. Let's get on with these different models. Let's talk about zero dividend growth. Hopefully you guys remember what a perpetuity is. A perpetuity is a set of identical cash flows that goes on for how long? Forever, right? And so the, uh, the formula for that is present value is equal to C over R, where C is that amount of cash flow that we get forever. R is the required return in decimal form. And it turns out that if we have a, a stock with constant dividends, all we have to do is convert that formula over for our use. Because we know the present value of those dividends is the price, thus pr uh, price at time zero. The dividend amount is D, and then we just divide by R. So it's very, very, very simple. In fact, I would write this formula down on your cheat sheet uh, and, and have it, and it's so much easier than doing the calculator. Some formulas are easier. You have a question you're stretching? Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, that's okay. I get it. I'm at that age where I need to stretch a lot, too. So is it the, the nominal rate or the real rate? That's going, okay, so everything that we see out there is the nominal rate. The only reason, the only time we're going to be talking about real rate is if we're talking in the context of inflation, but here we're actually talking about the nominal rate. Don't get confused because we used little r for real rate back in chapter five. Okay, now, by the way, does this actually happen in the real world? The answer is yes. 
there is a weird kind of stock called preferred stock that pays a dividend. And that dividend is the same over the life of the stock. So it's like five bucks, five bucks, five bucks every year. And so if we have stock like that, we absolutely can use this formula to price it. And more frequently, what happens is that people know the dividend and they know the price from the market and they can use those two things to determine what is the required return on that preferred stock. And as the company gets riskier, what do you think happens to that required return? It goes up and the value of the stock goes down. Now, what about constant dividend growth? That first uh, state we said was constant dividends. This is constant dividend growth, where dividends grow at the same rate throughout all time. And this can actually be useful for modeling some kinds of common stock. For instance, we uh, say that utility uh, dividends tend to grow at the rate of inflation. Utility firms, people that create electricity, water, gas, that sort of thing. Um, their, their dividends tend to grow with the rate of inflation. If the rate of inflation is fairly steady, then those utility firms, their dividends are going to grow at about that rate. And so we can actually use this to kind of model uh, their, their value. Now notice we still have P sub zero on the left hand side, but when we get to D, now what are we talking about? We can't just say D because every dividend is different. Why is every dividend different? Because now it's growing at a constant rate. Each following one is bigger, bigger, bigger. Does that make sense? Okay, now, what that means is uh, we have to say which dividend we're talking about. And the one that we're talking about is D sub one. The dividend we're talking about is D sub one. Let's see if I can erase some stuff here. Okay, now when we are reading a problem, one of the things we have to be able to do is determine whether we're being given D sub 0 or D sub 1. With finance, math is important, but reading is equally important. If they say the last dividend was, that's a D sub 0. If they say, just paid. That is a D sub zero. If they say next dividend will be, that's D one. If they say will pay in one year, that is D sub 1. And so really what you're looking at here is if it is past or present, you're looking at D sub 0. If it's future, less than or equal to one year, then you're talking about D sub 1. So that's the first thing you've got to do when you read these problems. Now sometimes what you're going to see is that they have not given you D1, they've given you D0. Not a problem, because we know the dividends are growing at G, which is the growth rate. I need to get back to that first formula. Let's look at the first formula up there. There's D sub 1, and we're going to divide by, and this time instead of dividing by R, we're dividing by R minus G. What do you think G is? Yeah, it's the growth rate. Now once again, it has to be in a decimal. It has to be in a decimal, just like R. And then at the end of that thing, we say R must be greater than G. What do you think we say R must be greater than G? Because it's not growing if it's changed. I'm for it to be positive, right? Yeah, so it's, it's really just a math thing, right? So R has to be greater than G. Uh, it, what if R was equal to G? If you divide by zero, uh, you get, depends on who you ask. If you ask an engineer, they'll tell you infinity. If you ask a mathematician, they'll tell you undefined, right? And the computer will say division by zero. Not allowed, right? Okay, what if G was greater than R? Then your stock price would be negative. 
Can we have negative stock prices? Do you remember why? We can't have negative stock prices because it's a legal thing. Do you remember? Yeah, limited liability. We can't have negative stock prices. And so we know that R must be greater than G. Now, keep in mind that this is for firms with constant dividend growth. In the next uh, model, we are going to allow for short terms the G to be greater than R. But it works out mathematically because we're not trying to cram it into this formula. Any questions? Okay. Now we're on to, uh, well, let's, let's, we're going to rearrange this formula. And this is called the dividend growth model. You may also hear it called the dividend discount model. There's all sorts of names for this. But we start with that price formula for constantly growing dividends. And then we rearrange it. We rearrange it to solve for R. We rearrange it to solve for R. And when we do, we can see that R is equal to D1 over P0 plus G. And if you think back to chapter 10, we said that stock returns were, uh, you add what, uh, dividend yield and capital gains yield together to get total returns. What do you think D1 over P0 is? D1 over P0 has a name. It says it over there, dividend yield. Yeah, dividend yield. She actually read it on the slide. There we go. It's <laughs> dividend yield. Right? Okay, now we said the total return was dividend yield plus capital gains yield. What's left over after dividend yield here? It's that growth rate of the dividends. What does that mean? It means that the growth rate of the dividends is the same as the capital gains yield. The growth rate in the dividend is the same as the capital gains yield. And what is the capital gains yield? It's just the rate at which the stock price grows. The capital gains yield is the rate at which the stock price grows. And so the amazing thing that we see here is that for a company with continuously growing dividends, the price increases at the same rate as the dividends. Let me say that again. For a company with continuously uh, growing dividends, constantly, constant dividend growth, the stock price grows at the same rate as the dividends. And that's actually going to Give us another piece, another helpful piece of information here. Sometime you may at, be asked, you'll be given a stock, and they'll tell you that the dividend's growing at 5% per year, and you'll be asked, what is going to be the value of that stock in five years? And there are a couple of ways to go about that, but the easiest one is not obvious to most students, but let's, let's walk through this. First of all, we know that D sub 0 is equal to, oh, D, D1, sorry. D1 is equal to D0 times 1 plus G. What if I want D2? Well, D2 is equal to D1 times 1 plus G, which is actually D0 times 1 plus G times 1 plus G is equal to D0 times 1 plus G squared. And it just keeps going like that. And so what you can actually get to is to say that D sub Y is equal to D sub X times 1 plus G to the Y minus X power. 2 minus zero gives us two, right? And so now I can do something really weird. I could tell you uh, D679, and I could ask you what the dividend will be at time 729. And all you would do is take 729 minus 679 and come up with 50, 
and you would take D679 and multiply it by 1 plus G to the 50th power. That's all you would do. And so you can actually predict what dividends are going to be out way out in the future without having to go one dividend at a time like we did right here. Now remember I said that the price grows at the same rate as the dividend. So it turns out we could do precisely the same thing with price. We can also take it all the way down to here and say that P sub Y is equal to P sub X times 1 plus G to the Y minus X. And now I can be asking you about what's the price of the stock going to be years into the future. And most of the time, here's what students do. They're like, well, wait a minute. If I need to know the price in year 70, I know that I need D71 divided by 1, uh, divided by R minus G, right? And they're like, oh, okay. Well, how do I get to D71? I'll say, well, first of all, I know that D1 is D0 times 1 plus G. And so they'll calculate D1. And then they multiply by 1 plus G again. And they do it again. And they do it again. And they do it again. And it takes freaking forever. Right? But they eventually come up with D71. They throw it in the formula and come up with D70. Now, what if they knew this formula right here? Well, they could say that D71 is equal to D0 plus 1 times 1 plus G to the 71st power, right? So they could figure that out and plot this into the formula. Or they could have started this way. P sub 0 is equal to D1 over R minus G. And they could go ahead and figure out what is P0. In this case, we're saying they're starting with D sub 0. They could figure this out and then just use this formula to find what that future price is. And so this is an amazingly quick way to travel through time. I gave, the first time I ever taught this class, I was down in Mississippi, and I, I had told them all this, but it was so funny because the first question on the exam was this, finding out what is the price at time 70. And I could see that there were students that sat there for like 30 minutes, times 1.09, times 1.09, times 1. You're going to lose track, right? And it took them 30 minutes. And they failed. Does that make sense? So keep in mind the shortcuts. Two shortcuts. Should these be on your note sheet? Absolutely. OK, let's talk about the relationship no, 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 no. Let's, let's not. Okay. Let's talk about one more thing here. In this model, P sub 0 is equal to D1 over R minus G. If the required return is higher, what happens to the price? Yeah, it's lower because you're dividing by something bigger, right? Now, what if growth is higher? What happens to the price? If you're subtracting something larger, then the thing on the bottom is getting smaller, which means our price is going up. Which would you rather buy? A stock that was paying a dividend of a dollar per year that was going to grow at 5%, or one that was paying a dollar a year that was going to grow at 10%? Yeah, 10%. So it makes all the sense in the world that the higher the growth rate, the more valuable the stock is. The higher the growth rate, the more valuable the stock is. The lower the risk, the more valuable the stock is. Now, what, did I, what jump did I make there? We saw, I've already said the lower the rate, the more valuable the stock is. How did the rate get to be lower? Lower risk. Lower risk requires lower return. Lower return, required return, gives us greater present values, gives us greater stock values. Okay, now we're to the part that everyone hates. And this is differential dividend growth. And this is where we're going to grow really fast in the beginning, 
and then it's going to level off to a constant level of growth. Differential or supernormal dividend growth. So, why might we expect this to be? Well, if you're a newer company and you're just starting to pay dividends, uh, your dividends probably aren't going to be very big. But, as your sales continue to grow, but your growth opportunities drop, you're not investing as much, and then you might turn into this uh, more stable one. So in the beginning, the growth rate is going to be fast simply because you start out paying small amounts. And so when you go from 10 cents to 20 cents, that's a 100% increase. But when you go from 20 cents to 30 cents, it's only a 50% increase. And so it makes sense in the beginning, these are going to be fast, and then they're going to slow down. Now, in these situations, your R can be less than G, but just for short periods of time. Not for that end period when you've got constantly growing dividends, but for the upfront period uh, where you are, it's possible you could have R less than G. Now, unfortunately, there is no formula. Let me say that again. There is no formula. So instead of a formula, what I'm going to do is give you a method. I'm going to give you a method, and I would encourage you to have the method written down on your formula sheet. I would encourage you to have the method written down on the formula sheet. So here's the method. Number one, we're going to find the individual dividend amounts up to the start of constant growth. So we're going to see that we're going to have fast growth and then constant growth. And so we're going to be going up to this point where it shifts over to constant growth. Number two, we're going to find the price of the stock at the start of constant growth. By the way, the price of the stock at the start of constant growth is represents the present value of all the dividends going on beyond that date. And so let's say that constant growth started at time 70. This formula right here gives me the present value for all the dividends, 71 and beyond. Does that make sense? And so that's why we're able to use that one single price at the time that constant dividend growth starts to represent all of the rest of the dividends. And then the last step is we're going to find the present value of these dividends and the stock price. So, best way for us to learn this is through an example. By the way, if you don't have your calculator out, get it out now. If you don't have your calculator out, get it out now. So, they start out telling us that a company plans to pay a dividend of $1.15 one year from today. Then, over the next four years, the dividend will grow at 15% per year. And so, we're actually going to have two growth rates that we have to talk about here. Back, let's go ahead and talk about that dividend of $1.15 one year from today. Is that D0 or D1? D1. And the first growth rate they tell us is 15%. I'm going to go ahead and write that down as a decimal because we know when we throw it into the formula it's got to be a decimal. And then they say it's going to settle down after that to a second growth rate of 0 0.1, 10%. Okay, now they're asking what is the value of one share of the company's stock today if the required return is 15%? R is equal to 0 0.15. I'm going to put it in decimal also because that's how we, uh, that's how we do this. Now, I'm going to tell you that if you don't do the next thing, you will get the wrong answer. You will get the wrong answer. And so the next thing to do is to draw a picture. And you may not be the world's best artist, but this picture will be so helpful to you. So here we go. First thing that I'm going to draw in there is that green up arrow for $1.15. The first thing I'm going to draw in there is that green up arrow for $1.15. And the second thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and read the problem. If you read the problem, it says they're going to pay $1.15 one year from today. Then, over the next 
four years, it's going to grow at that 15% rate. How do I know if that's going to end at time four or time five? It turns out you don't have to be a mathematical genius. You just have to have a finger. And here's how we're going to do it. And I'm going to use the cursor here to simulate the finger. So get down here at time one. And so we know that they just paid that, $1.15 at time one. And then they say now, then for the next four years. And so I'm going to say one, two, three, four. And wherever my finger ends up, that is the start of the constant dividend growth. So that's the kindergarten method. It's an easy way for you to figure out. Now, what if they told me that d sub zero was a dollar and that then the growth would be for the next four years? Well, I would have started over here at zero and we would have ended up at year four. So you have to start the kindergarten method at the dividend that they give you. If they give you D0, start there. If they give you D1, start there. Okay, now they tell us, so then what we do is we're going to calculate these individual dividends up to that point, and we're going to use this situation right here where we're going to take the uh, previous dividend, multiplied by 1 plus G, that's going to give us the next dividend. And that's how we're going to get all those dividends up to time 5. And then we're going to figure out a price at time five that represents all those dividends times six and beyond. So let's get our calculators out. I'm going to show you the easiest way in the world to do this. Are you ready to see the easy way? See it. Second. Clear work. We don't get the zero. Therefore, C at zero is zero. You never get to zero unless I tell you you got to zero, and I don't think I ever will. Arrow down. What is our cash flow at time one? 1.15. And I've got to hit enter, or it's like it never even happened. Now, the other thing that I'm going to do here is say store one. And you'll see why here in just a little bit. I'm going to arrow down. F0, all the F0s here will always be 1 because this is constantly growing, right? No two cash flows are alike. Arrow down. For C02, I'm going to use the formula that uh, D2 is equal to D1 times 1 plus G. So I'm going to say here, by the way, where do I have D1 stored? Yeah, so I'm going to say recall 1 times 1 plus G1, which happens to be 0.15, times 1, uh, times 1.15 equals. That is my D2. Don't let it freak you out that there's some change over here. Okay, now I'm going to do two things. I'm going to hit enter, and what's the other thing I'm going to do? Store. Where am I going to store it? Two. Two. Very good. Arrow down. Arrow down. What do I do here? Recall. Two. two. And then I'm going to multiply by one plus G2. What is that? How much? 1.15 equal. I've got to hit enter. What else? Store three. Very good. Store three. Arrow down, arrow down. What next? Recall three times how much? Yeah, 1.15 equals enter. What am I going to do now? Store four. Store, oh, yeah, store four, right? Okay, arrow down, arrow down. What do I do here? Recall four times what? 1.15 equal enter store five. Now, remember we said that we were going to do this up to the beginning of the constant dividend growth. Time five is when the constant dividend growth happens. So we have satisfied the first one. 
which was to find the individual dividend amounts up to the start of constant growth. Now we need to find the price of the stock at the start of constant growth. And so we're going to get our calculator up here. And it turns out that D, or no, P5, sorry, P5 is equal to D5 times 1 plus G over the R minus G. So just like I, well, I don't have it up here, but if I had, so this is actually D6, right? D6, we could substitute D5 times 1 plus G. Now, the thing to note here is this is the second growth rate. This is the second growth rate. Remember that fast growth is over. And so we're going to put our twos here. Okay, now, if we're going to look at these cash flows, what we're going to see is CF0 is equal to 0, C01 is D1, C02 is D2, C03 is D3, C04 is D4, C05 is equal to D5. Are you ready for it? Plus P5. Why? Because we're going to collect that dividend at time 5, and then we're going to immediately sell the stock for P5. And so that means both those cash flows are basically happening at time 5. Okay, so how do I find P5? Well, I already have D5 in my calculator. All I've got to multiply is by 1 plus G2. What's G2? 0 0.10. Yeah, 0 0.10. So I'm going to multiply by 1.1. .1. That gives me D6, right? And now I need to divide by R minus G. So here's how I'm going to do that. I hit divide by open parenthesis, what is R? Yeah, 0.15 minus, what is G2? 0 0.1. So that gives me 0 0.05 on the bottom. I'm going to say equal to, and that's going to give me P5. So this P5 is $44.25. Now, is P5 the only cash flow we're getting at time 5? No. We have to now add back D5. Where do I have D5? In my memory, right? So all I've got to do is say plus, recall, 5, equal. And I've got to hit enter. If I don't hit enter, it's like it never even happened. Okay, now that I have all those things in my cash flows, how in the world would I find the sum of the present values of all those things? Say again? What, but there's a button that I should hit next. Which is it? Yeah, NPV, NPV. And the first question I'm asking me is, what is I, which is the required return? And we're going to do 15%. But keep in mind that when you type stuff into this calculator like this, it's always in percentage, not in decimal. So I'm going to hit enter, and then I'm going to arrow down. Is the NPV actually zero? No, what should I do? Compute. compute. You see it says up here, it gives you instructions, it says compute. Okay, now, $27. What does that mean? First of all, if the stock is out there trading, it should be trading at $27. And that $27 represents the per share present value of all the dividends going forward. We started with all those numbers in per share basis, and so the price that we get on the end is also in per share basis. Most common mistakes that students make Forgetting to add back D5. Forgetting to add back D5 is the absolute most common mistake that students make. Now I'm going to tell you 
that you may have watched this and you think it looks pretty easy. I'm going to tell you that it took me like six years to be able to do this problem on the board without messing it up. So just because I make it look easy doesn't make it easy. Now, I have given you the absolute easiest way possible to do this problem using the memory and that sort of thing. Okay, the memory and the kindergarten method. I have boiled this thing down to the simplest th the way that I know. If you figure out a simpler way, please let me know. Now, this is going to be a time-consuming, difficult problem. How many do you think I will have on the exam? One. Each exam has 40 questions. That means that every question is worth how much, percentage-wise? 2.5%. What should you do when you hit this question? Skip it. Skip it. And come back to it at the end when you're just feeling nice and confident and you've got all sorts of time. Then you can take a crack at this. Does that make sense? Uh, some of you will just say, you know, poof, I'm going to skip it anyway, right? That's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. I don't judge. Okay. If you do want to be able to do this, I'm telling you, you're going to have to watch this more than once to be able to be able to get it to work. Okay. Now, let's talk about estimating G. If we're going to estimate G for use in this sort of stuff, there are two ways we can do it. Number one is the historic average dividend growth rate. And so if I gave you a set of doll, uh, a set of dividends and I said, "Well, the first dividend was a dollar, their second dividend was a dollar ten, and their third dividend was a dollar twenty-one. You could do the math and tell me that their historical average annual increase was ten percent, and you could use that. That's my favorite way. The second way is to use the retention ratio multiplied by the return on retained earnings. So we're going to say, how much of our earnings are we retaining? That's the retention ratio. By the way, what was the letter we used for retention ratio when we were talking in chapter 3? Remember we said that uh, internal growth rate was equal to ROA times what? B. Very good. So it's just the same B that we're talking about here. That's the retention ratio. So I could take that times the return on retained earnings. That would be the other way for me to calculate G. If I give you historical dividend uh, information, I would encourage you to use that information. If not, if I give you the retention ratio and the, oh, by the way, what is the return on retained earnings? Retained earnings, where do they show up on the balance sheet? They are under? Equity. They're under equity. So what would our return on retained earnings be? It would just be the return on equity, or R-O-E. So all we end up with here is B times ROE. B times ROE is our other way of estimating the dividend growth rate. Now let's talk about, actually let's flip forward and see I think you may be able to do your homework. Okay, so cautions regarding the dividend uh, growth model. If your estimate of G is too high by 1%, what happens to your estimate of R? Oh, come on. This one's 1% too high over here. What does this have to be? It's also 1% too high. If this one's 1% too low, then this one's 1% too low. Now, why do we care? Because when we're figuring out the value of things, we're taking the present value. If I overestimate G, then I overestimate R. I underestimate the present value of those future cash flows. I might walk away from a good project. What if I underestimate G? Then I might underestimate R. I will overestimate the present value of the future cash flows, and I might accept a bad project. And so you want to make sure that your estimate of G is as accurate as possible because any error you make on G is going to show up in R. Uh, 
Now let's talk about growth opportunities and stock value. We have uh, firms that are called cash cows. I don't know if you guys are familiar with cows, but here's how it works when a cow uh, is during her, her prime milking years. Every day the cow comes in, twice per day, morning and night, and you milk the cow. And pretty much every day, you're getting the same amount of milk out of the cows. By the way, who do you think makes more milk? Happy cows or sad cows? Happy cows. Happy cows. So one of the things that you do while you're milking the cows is you feed them, right? Do you, are you happy when you're eating? Oh, yeah. Uh, and you'll talk sweetly, maybe sing a song, that sort of thing. Okay. So but the cows are given the same milk. In fact, the cow's very much like a bond because you can think of those milks as coupons. And then when the cow stops giving milk, what do we do? We sell her to who? The butcher. the butcher. Very good. And so that's like the face value of the cow. And we sell the cow at the end. And then the next time you visit McDonald's, you're reunited with your old cow. Okay, now, why do we call these firms cash cows? They don't have any growth opportunities. And so they are not having to save any money. They're not having to retain any money for future growth. So what they are doing instead is paying out dividends. And so in this case, the dividends are equal to the EPS. Remember earlier I told you it was possible for dividends to be equal to EPS if they weren't paying, if they weren't retaining any earnings. And that's exactly what's going on here. And why aren't they retaining any earnings? Because they don't have any growth opportunities. They have no need for more investment. Okay, so we know that the price per share of a cash cow firm is earnings per share divided by the required return. What if the firm has growth opportunities though? If the firm has growth opportunities, that's going to be additional value on top of the cash cow value. And so we can actually figure out the value by taking the net present value of all of those growth opportunities, adding them together, and dividing by the number of shares outstanding. And that's going to give me the net present value of the growth opportunities on a per share basis. And then I just add that on to the cash cow value, and that's going to give me the value of a firm with growth options. And so that's what that piece of zero is. And by the way, be sure you mark in your notes that that NPV go is per share. The NPV go is per share. And so when you look at what the stock price should look like. By the way, a cash cow firm is constantly paying out the same dividend and that dividend never grows. What does that mean about the price of a cash cow firm? It's going to stay the same, right? It's going to stay the same forever. Remember, that's how perpetuities work. So the price is going to stay the same forever on a cash cow. But what if you've got a firm with growth opportunities? The price on that's going to grow and it's going to be based on these uh, net present value of the growth opportunities. What's the goal of financial management? Maximize, Maximize shareholder wealth. And so what you'll see, I'll give you an example here, uh, Google. Google has two, two pieces of it. Google has the cash cow portion, which is their advertising business. And then they're also doing crazy crap. What kind of crazy crap does Google do? AI! Have you seen what Gemini thinks George Washington looks like? That's just freaky! Okay, so um, lots of freaky stuff going on with AI. Are they guaranteed to win? No. Do they think it has a positive NPV? Yes, or they wouldn't be doing it, or they shouldn't be doing it. Let me put it that way. Now, what's some other crazy crap that Google's done over the years? Do you yeah, Google Glasses! And then uh, that didn't turn out well because they called people that wore them glass holes, right? Uh, now, that didn't, you didn't know about the glass holes? Yeah, look that up. Okay, so uh, some other crazy stuff that they did. Google Maps. 
Why the hell should Google get into maps? Well, it turns out that people do a lot of searching around them for stuff, and now they're able to basically sell placements on, on maps. It makes sense. So if you're going to grow the stock price of the firm, you're going to need to take care of the cash cow portion, and you're also going to need to pursue those growth opportunities, but only if they have positive net present value. OK, next time. We will talk about what this means for the P-E ratio, and we will get into stock features.